Alright guys. How's everybody doing today? Good. I'm good, I'm good. So I'm kind of here today to talk to you guys about addiction, how it starts, how you get through it, and what leads you to it. And um, I'm very grateful to be here. It's a wonderful opportunity. And I want y'all to know that I'm just going to be honest with you. I'm just going to be upfront with y'all. I'm going to tell you a lot of real life things that happened to me. A lot of real life things y'all might have either experienced at home with your families or y'all might even be experiencing. You know, I mean, I started at a young age, started in high school. But, um, you know, I want you guys to know it's okay to ask questions. There's no shame in anything. You can ask whatever questions you want. I will answer them. You will not hurt my feelings with whatever you ask. It's okay. Um, but just keep that in mind. And with that being said, um, so I'll tell y'all a little bit about how I grew up. I grew up in a good home, grew up in a good neighborhood, we were well provided for. My dad worked a lot. My mom was always out with my younger sisters. And I am 26, by the way, and I have three younger sisters. And so while my dad was always at work, my mom was always with my sister, so that left me kind of in the wind. And I learned quickly that it was hard to get the attention of my parents because they were always engaged. My dad out of the work, my mom with the girls. And so that left me fighting for attention. And, you know, I wound up going through my childhood, always trying to do the thing that got the most praise. And so that led me to quickly develop being able to achieve. I had goals, I wanted to meet those goals, and I did them in a way that required my dad to notice me. If he didn't notice me, I'd show his face, all right, you know? And, but you know, he would always brush it off and go, or you could have done better. And so that developed the mindset of I had to be better. And, you know, I can honestly say, growing up, there was no reason for me to need to use. You know, I wasn't, in areas where, honestly, you had to go looking if you wanted to. And it wasn't things that just found you. You know, I was in, I lived in Raleigh. I was born in Mount Airy. But um, I grew up in Raleigh. And being there, I went to a good school. I was on sports teams. I played tennis. I was in chorus. I was active there. I did a whole bunch of things in school. Me and all my friends, we did a whole bunch of fun stuff. I went to all the games, I had fun childhood, I did all the cool, awesome things with my friends. Um, you know, and there was never really a problem other than where I just always felt the need that I had an expectation of me. I felt the need that no matter how hard I tried, it was not enough. And that developed a void in me, that developed a sense of not enough whether it be with myself or my actions of what I did or things like that, it developed that mentality of lesson. He gave me a lesson mentality. And so once I developed that, I wound up putting myself in situations where I would be noticed, where I wouldn't matter, surrounding myself with people who told me I did, you know, engaged in behaviors that entertain that mindset. Now, whether that be, I hung out with the party guys. I hung out with the guys who went to parties. I hung out with the guys who did all the fun things, you know, who were in all the sports and stuff, who were constantly in where all the action was, with all the things. And um, I led, and that led me to just need to be in the middle of something all the time. There was no downtime in my life, and when there was, I hated every minute because I was thinking about all of the Man, I should have done this to be better. Or, man, I remember talking to so-and-so. Man, I should have said that. And, you know, just doing what you do at the end of the day when you, when you ain't got no more homework that you didn't do. And you got a, you don't have your friends texting you back anymore because it's late. And you're sitting there you're playing your video game. And you're going, you're just sitting there going through a college wondering what happened. What happened with your day where you could have been better. You know, when you think about these things, these are thoughts that we all have, you know, regardless of the circumstance, you have these thoughts because you always wonder what could have been different. And, you know, 
so far, I'm gonna pause. With where I've gone so far, what would justify wanting to use from where I've gone so far? I don't know, we need a couple of answers, but so far. It doesn't seem like a whole lot. Right. It doesn't seem like a whole lot. It doesn't seem like there's enough reason to do something crazy, right? Everything's going pretty good. Life seems pretty fine. So with that being said, you know, I'm going through high school up. By the way, I graduated with a 1.8 GPA. I would advise that y'all not do that. Um, and, you know, I did the bare minimum in school, just enough to graduate. And school was a social event for me. I went to have fun. I mean, my mom will tell you, I got my mom's back there in the blue shirt. She will tell you that I failed gym because I chose to go in there and sleep rather than dress up. And I would get half the grade just for dressing up. And I still refused to. I went and fell asleep on the gym floor. That's what I did. And so I just didn't really want to do it by that standard. I wanted to be accepted. And I wanted it to be in a social setting. I didn't want it to be the curriculum base because I hated like staring at the paper and stuff all the time. I, I would do the bare minimum to get by to get out of school, go party, go hang out with my friends, go do all the fun things. I didn't want to worry about the mundane things because when I did then, it forced me to have to sit down and focus on things that I didn't consider fun. And so with that being said, that was the behavior I entertained that led me to further things in life. That led me to wanting to always be entertained. I had to have something going on. If there was a football game, I was at it. If there were other games, I was at it. If there was anything remotely fun, I was there. It was whatever, wherever the biggest crowd was at lunch, you better believe I was in the middle of it. And I was hanging out with everybody in there, gossiping about who was doing what, how they were doing it, everything else. Because I was entertained. And it kept me distracted. And it kept me from the things I didn't want to deal with. I didn't want to deal with those thoughts. I didn't want to deal with the things that I considered to define me. You know, and those core thoughts of, why don't one, my parents want to pay attention? To me? Because at the end of the day, now I'm older, I recognize, man, they were just busy trying to provide. But, you know, at a young age, you sit there going, why can't they just pay attention to me? You know, I mean, they had me. Why don't they want to be around me? You know, those kinds of thoughts, those kinds of things. And, you know, I learned very quickly that those thoughts define my actions. And I had a choice. I could have chose to deal with those things and move forward in life accordingly, but I did not. I chose to distract myself from the hurts that I had. And that's where my problem started, is with the thoughts, with the mindsets. That is where it all happened. And so dealing with it, I chose to go and entertain myself. And with that being said, you know, I graduated barely. And I was I was just as surprised as my mom was when I graduated. And then from there I wound up working two jobs. I worked at Highway 55 and I worked at Wendy's. And uh, you know, I'm always had money. I was doing pretty good for how old I was. And uh, then I wound up getting a job because I wanted to learn to trade. I didn't want to go to college. I hated high school to be on. I hated all kinds of school. I didn't want to go to college. And so I wanted to trade because I wanted to work with my hands because there was always something to do. There was always something to keep me busy. And so that's why I wanted it. And I wanted to be able to look at something I did and go, I did good. You know, I wanted that. And so I wound up getting a job working for a paint crew. And I wound up learning to do painting, sheetrock, and light carpentry. I've learned a whole bunch with uh, where I work now with a bunch of guys, but that's besides the point. But I uh, quickly learned that I excelled quickly at my job because I was able to focus on a whole bunch of things at once. And I had an achiever's personality. I wanted it and I wanted to do the best and be the best at it. And that put me forward. And I was, when I was 18, I moved out and I moved into a house my boss owned, and he 
rented it out by the room, and I was making four hundred a week, and my rent was only four fifty a month, and that was lights, water, Wi-Fi included, all the fun things, and all my roommates were all girls that were older than me, and they partied about three four times a week, and they would have all their coworkers over, and they would all throw parties. So at eighteen years old, I am. What well, most of y'all wouldn't consider by a lot of the music that's out, I was living the dream. And I treated it just like that. I was having fun, I was working hard, I was doing everything I felt I deserved. I was doing everything that kept me distracted. I had the best of both worlds. I had a good job. I owned the truck that I had, I paid for it, and I had all the friends in the world. I was constantly entertained. I'd get off from work, they'd be starting to party, and I'd be like, sweet. But eventually that takes a toll. And, you know, eventually I wound up being exhausted and hungover and all these other things. And then uh, I remember I was hungover one day and I was at work. We were working exterior in the summertime. Doing that hungover is awful when it's like 80, 90 degrees outside with high humidity. You ain't really slept in days. It's terrible. So anyways, my coworker, he used pretty heavy. And he wound up asking me, he's like, hey man, I got some if you want some. And, you know, I had said no up to that point to his stuff that he did because it was harder. I mean, I kind of dabbled with some other things that were lighter, you know. But I didn't go into heavy things yet until that day when I was like, you know what? I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And honestly, I just want to get through today. And I knew that he was wired and it looked like he got him through the day. And so I did it. And you know, that wasn't when I got hooked. I got hooked when it was probably about three, four months later, when it was, I wasn't willing to change the lifestyle I was living in order to be better. You know, I wanted both. I wanted the party lifestyle and the success. You cannot have both. You're either gonna be focused on how you're gonna succeed or you're gonna party. There is no, you can't have fun. Um, and right now what I want to ask you guys is how does the future look from where I stand in the story right now? What kind of things do you think it's going to lead to? How could I have prevented being where I am currently at in the story? And what are y'all's opinions on what could have been done differently? What do y'all think? Y'all can please ask me questions. It's totally why I'm here. <laughs> Looks like it's going to lead to you talking about talking to high school is about addiction. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> and that's exactly right. It has. But just from what y'all have experienced in your own lives, because I'm sure you have, because I did in my school, what are the chances of that outcome? Very slim. Why is it slim? There's no wrong answers, guys. Because if you get hooked and you run out of money and you do stupid stuff to get the money, then you end up in jail, then you, most people stay there because they can't get better. I don't even need to say anything else. <laughs> you, <sound good> <laughs> you are exactly right. And that's all from justifying my actions. I thought I deserved it. I couldn't go without it because if I went without it, every thought I had that I considered to be true, which was wrong, I needed to numb. I needed to get away from. I couldn't be in my own mind. The reason being is because my mind was in prison. And if I was not high and distracted, I couldn't be in it because just like you said, certain things come along with that lifestyle because eventually the job doesn't give you enough money and you can't work enough to do the upkeep for the habit. You cannot and it is brutal and then all it does is drag you down and those around you down. And what winds up happening when that happens is 
to put it into perspective, I had a wife, I had a son, I had a house that was paid about four months in advance on rent uh, when I was uh, 21. And by the time I was 20, and I had about eight to 10 grand in the bank. By the time I was 21 and a half, money was gone, wife was gone, son was gone, home was gone, was living in and out of hotel rooms and out of my car in six months. It goes quick when you got a lot of pain. And the reason I had all that pain is because I chose not to deal with it. And the reason I chose not to deal with it is because, to be honest, it was just a lot easier to get high. It was a lot easier to go work and achieve that goal and be able to get the money, go be distracted, and go forget that I even had a problem. But the problem with that mindset is you never forget you have that problem. There is never enough distractions. There is never enough things to separate you from your mind because it's part of you. And so what it boiled down to is I needed to deal with myself. But I had no clue how to deal with being with myself. I didn't have a relationship really with my parents because I had alienated myself from my family because I didn't want to be around them because I was ashamed of who I had become and where I was hanging out and who I was hanging out with. And it was dangerous. And in this time, I had another daughter with her mother and that she had moved to South Carolina. My ex-wife now, she had moved down to Florida with my son and my other daughter that I had with her. They would moved away from me because I was hanging around dangerous people. And I was one of them. And my kids, I didn't want them around that. And I wasn't a father. And so I figured it'd be better if they weren't there with me. And so that wound up leading to me losing what most people would fight for. And so I wound up quitting fighting. I didn't have anything to fight for, so I just got worse and worse and worse. Which, it's hard to get worse when you're homeless, helpless, and hopeless. It's hard to get worse than that. But there is a way, because it does get worse. I wound up going in and out of jails. <coughs> I wound up being um, in a lot of crim criminal activities that I should not have been involved with. And, you know, it just led to more and more things that caused me to do worse and worse things. And, you know, that guilt and the shame and the pain of everything caused me to be separated. And it wasn't until I had two different warrants. South Carolina and North Carolina. I was working in both states and doing a whole bunch of other things to get money. And I wound up getting picked up on those warrants in Raleigh. Um, and I wound up going to jail. And I'll never forget going through withdrawals in jail, which is awful, because you're sitting in jail, you're sleeping on cold steel, the mattress will give you, it's about that thick. And you're in there in a little eight foot long cell, maybe six foot wide, maybe. And all you get to stare at all day is concrete and think about everything you've done with no drugs, nobody else in there with you. And you are just alone by yourself. Think about every wrong thing you've ever done. And that sucks. And so I remember being in there, coming to face every thought I had and you know, had no guidance in there on how to deal with them. And so you just sit there and it's just a constant replay of everything I could have done, everything I should have done, all those things. And then I wound up uh, going in uh, to the regular block with everyone else because I had to do quarantine. They did quarantine because of COVID. So you had to spend like six, seven days quarantine before they moved you over. So I sat there a week going through withdrawals. It was awful. <clears throat> I wound up withdrawing for about three four weeks is how long it took to get everything out of my system. It was awful. I wound up going to another one and got with a study group in one of the other cells or in the other block um, and they were of the faith and believers and stuff and so they kind of helped me get the best direction I've had in life so far because everybody else was just people in the streets who dealt drugs and everything that comes along with that lifestyle. They were the only ones who taught me anything. So this is my first time. Uh, accepting that kind of things and learning a better way. And so then I wound up being able to cut a deal to my charges in North Carolina would get dismissed if I assigned extradition for South Carolina to come and get me. And so I wound up doing that after I had been in there about a month. And then South Carolina came and got me. And I spent about 
three months down there. I had no clue what I was doing when I got out. Um, up until probably about the last month, I was talking with my mom because she was like, you're not coming in. And so, you know, I wound up uh, getting uh, my mom worked with Sonia. So me being able to have a place to go in a recovery and, you know, there were different options. There were lesser ones, but I knew I needed a long term one because I needed to relearn a lot of things. I needed to learn how to deal with all the hurts, all the pain, all the evil that I had done. I needed to learn how to deal with it and work through it. And I couldn't do it on my own. I, I'd made that very clear. I tried to do everything else alone and it left me nothing but lonely. And so I wound up getting out and going to Pierce Ministries. And uh, I wound up completing their six month program back in January. And uh, they uh, taught me a lot of ways on how to grow and face problems, not how to bury them, how to work around the problems, but how to deal with the problems. And it is a brutal process of facing yourself. And it hurts, it still hurts, because I'm still doing it, because there's a lot of things that I still have to overcome. I still have to work through. But you know, I'm blessed to be at the point in that where I get to work around grown men way older than me. I'm the youngest guy in the program and have been the entire time I've been there. We get a new guy in tomorrow and thankfully he's younger than me so I finally have somebody younger than me. Um, but, uh, you know, and I've been blessed to grow not only with them but help them come and understand what I've understood which is I am not what I did. I'm not what others define me as a kid. I'm not that. And I have the opportunity to choose how I respond to where I'm at. You know, granted, the one choice might be harder than the other, but that harder choice is what will carry you through to better. And that is a fact. And that is something I've explained to the guys that I got now, because it's a, it is our recovery program. And, you know, some days they hate me because we work on the farm and we have to do all kinds of crazy stuff there. And, you know, they struggled like I did with the normal. They struggled with the mundane tasks, the boring tasks. They didn't like it the same as I did. And you know, it's I'm blessed to be able to help show them the fun that is in the morning. You can find joy where you're at. You just have to look. You have to notice it. And you know, it's really cool seeing guys who just like me went in hopeless and just this is the last option. And this is after I've flipped cars, I've had guns pulled on me, I've overdosed about five different times, all kinds of crazy things. Most normal people should not have to have dealt with by the time they're 26 years old. And learning that I don't have to have that in my life. I can wake up and have a normal day get to get up and be around these men, live a normal life. When you get far enough along in, in that old lifestyle, it's a blessing to wake up and cook breakfast in the kitchen in the morning. Things like that get taken for granted, but you don't realize that you are in the back of your car and it's 18 degrees outside and you're using drop cloths as a blanket and it sucks. And, you know, seeing and explaining that comparison to grown men who are well older than I am, that are in the 50s and some that are you know, one closest in age to me is Zach and he's 27. But, uh, you know, it's cool them seeing their worth, allowing them to grow in their worth and them learning that, you know, granted we all still try to achieve and where we're working at on the farm and in different activities, but they're recognizing that how good they do in the day does not define their worth through that day. They get to wake up and find out that there is joy in just being them and sitting there and that's it. And that is something that me and them as well never thought we would be able to have. Because you get to that point in your mind where you're like, how can I be good anymore? How do I have the capability of even knowing what good is? And you know, it's all learned. But you know, I just want to explain to y'all that that all starts with what you, how you choose to respond. And you know, if you have these hard questions and stuff in your life, with your parents, with your family, with friends, 
Ask those questions. Deal with those hurts. Do not bury them. Because I promise you no amount of work, no amount of drugs, no amount of relationships, no amount of anything, or, okay, no amount of anything will ever be enough to satisfy you. You will always be looking and you will never find it because it won't be enough. Learn to love who you are. There are many things to love about yourself. And if I could just express that, that's what I hope y'all take away. Because each one of you are awesome in your own right. And just, even if it's just writing down three things you like about yourself, holding it up and saying it into the mirror in the morning. If you do that, it sounds simple. It sounds silly. If you do that, it'll prevent you with a lot of hurt. And it will. And those things that you say are true. Good things you say about yourself are true. You are what you believe. So if you believe you're terrible and all these things, you'll be right. But if you believe that you are amazing, wonderful, beautiful, strong, able to overcome, if you believe those, you are. You are what you believe. Any questions? <clears throat> no questions. Feel free to ask uh, Nella any questions. You can ask her. Very valuable to be able to. So right now, right now, the battle I'm facing is my now ex-wife. She lives down in Florida, and she uh, is. She, if I call her, she will give me updates on the kids, but I don't get to see them yet. I have to earn that back. And my one daughter with her other mother, she lost custody of her last year. And so she's about to get custody back, hopefully in the next two to three months. And then I'll be able to see her. So that is an uphill battle for my actions. But I'm better off than where I was. Anyone else? At any point, did you think to yourself, like, while you were doing it, before you got in all the trouble, like, that it was starting to get to be too much, or did you just realize that after it was all over, it was like kind of too far? I mean, technically, it was never too far, but like once you were sitting in the jail cell or whatever. Is that the point where you thought, like, yeah, I need to stop? Or did well, you try before that? Or? I did not try. And the reason being for that is I didn't want to, because <coughs> how I saw it was I knew what using <coughs> I knew what it got me. It got me distracted as long as I did enough. But I didn't know what not using looked like. And I've done it since I was like 14, 15. And so I didn't know what that what I looked like without that. Because I've done started so young. And so I didn't know who I was outside of it. And that's why I wasn't able to, because I was afraid of who I would be. And all the things I'd done leading up to that point weren't good things. So I didn't think I could be a good person. Great question. Yeah. Anybody else? I like that question. I really like the way that you're being so truthful with the test. Because uh, you're, you're speaking on the dark side. And all I think about is the glamour. Yeah. From Hollywood and their music they listen to, how glamorous it is. You know, all the girls, or all the men, all the music, and all the, the drugs, and the fun. It's awesome how you put it into perspective. And I hope that they come away with something like this. I want to be honest with you guys, going off of what he said, that music y'all listen to, it justifies how you choose to act in life. So I would advise you, pay attention to what you listen to, because eventually it is what you will become, because you think it's cool, you think it's fun. You don't think it's funny when you are getting shot at. That's not funny. Not happening. All those things that they talk about and the raps, whatever, that's real. That's real life to some people. They get paid to talk about it. Very few of them actually live it. And that's hard. That's a very real thing to deal with. So just be careful with that. I'm really glad you brought that up. Any other questions? All right. To be honest with you, no, I didn't. And the reason being is because 
it got to the point I really just wanted to die. And that's just where it leads you. It leads you to that caged mindset of you don't think there's an escape. The escape that you know there is, you're not strong enough to overcome. And that gets really hard. It should have been enough. It should have been enough for my mom. It should have been enough for my little sisters who looked up to me. It should have been enough for my dad. It should have been enough for my kids and their mothers. But it, wasn't. it should have been enough for yourself. But speaking about that, we do have a lot of increased suicides for that very reason. Sad you to stop. Honestly, when I finally was able to sit still, when I was able to sit still and think about everything, and it got shown to me exactly what I'm telling y'all, that it was what I focused on. You know, I focused on all the bad. And I had a guy uh, who was actually on trial for murder. Uh, he was telling me in our cell, because he was my cellmate, he was telling me about what things that I did that were good in my life. And he helped me to find focus on those. And that if I maintained my perspective on those, it got to a point I wasn't really so worried about all the wrong I had done. Because I was, I was so focused on finding the good things. And you know, like I said, writing down those good things about yourself, saying it out loud, saying these things that are true. That is what helped me. Now, I, one thing I want to relate. Do you guys remember yesterday Joe Rick's presentation on reframing negative? That's what he did. 